Hello. Right, today I'm going to talk about land and planning. I'm going to go through the story of how I came to live here on this piece of land and I'll give some more general advice on buying land and using it. <laughs> Quite a lot to get through. Um, I also wanted to dispel some myths that people are, seem to have. Every time I start talking about this sort of thing, people have certain preconceptions, which aren't actually the case. The first thing I'm going to say is, among the most important bits of advice I got to give, is that whether or not you can live on a piece of land is largely down to your neighbours. If, if, if the people that live nearest to you, and I don't have any immediate neighbours, but there are people relatively close if they're okay with you living where you live you'll be fine councils these days because of all the cutbacks and everything this has become more and more a case are only going to act if there is sufficient complaint to do so you'll find you can get away with an awful lot more than you could back in the day when councils had money to act on people trying to do things a little bit out of the ordinary so when i lived here my initial plan was to live in secret and due to circumstances that plan was blown out of the water very early on um, because someone ended up coming to live here with me and they had a child and they were going to school every day and yeah so I had to go and talk to my neighbours and introduce myself and that I honestly believe was the saving grace and that's the reason that I'm still here they were then able just to put a face to what was going on they said that to me that it was just nice to know who was there and what they're doing and I could take the opportunity to reassure them that the place would not become a traveller's site, that it would just be me, this woman and her child living here, and there would not be any big parties, <laughs> we wouldn't be doing anything destructive or disruptive and just trying to live there quietly really. They were, as it turned out, fine with that, and here I still am many years later. Right, let's go and have a look then at the buildings, which you've probably already seen in other episodes, but I'll just go through them briefly and explain them in the, con in the context of how I came to build them and why I built each building when I did and so on and so forth. Okay we're back at the little cabin and this was the first building I built here and I built this to take advantage of the four-year rule. Now briefly the four-year rule states that if you build a house and you could live in it or it's occupied you don't have to live in it yourself but it's occupied for four years or more um, then you can make it legal a legal dwelling <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more detail but I won't get into that just yet so that's the gist of it this was my interpretation of the minimum requirement for a dwelling so this cabin is 10 foot by 10 foot it has or it had a bed a wardrobe, cooking facilities, um, lighting, things like that. It has to be permanent so a mobile home doesn't cut it and even a prefab cabin can be a bit sketchy. So this was built here, that was quite important. So it has to be permanent, built in situ and get those minimum requirements. It's also important that it's not concealed. So this cabin, I built it you can probably tell it's sheltered by the earth, it's, it's not underground, it's sort of dug into the hillside a bit. Um, and it's got, it's got a camo net over the roof, but it's not actually concealed. I've not hidden it behind bales of straw, which is what the guy famously did when he built his Mock Tudor mansion. And then thought the planning for ages and that. Um, so this isn't concealed. You can't see it from any of the footpaths anywhere around, and it, it is pretty much invisible from anywhere that's not right in front of it and yet it's not concealed. So I built this and lived in this and then I thought well people are still going to see me coming and going. People other than my neighbours will know that I live here and they, that may not be a good thing. So then I built another cabin very cheaply. These are all very cheaply made as you can probably tell. So then I built what I called a big cabin. So let's go and have a look at that. So this is the big cabin, um, it looks in pretty poor repair, that's because it is. It's been here 
a lot longer than I intended it to be. Um, this was essentially built as a decoy and I figured that if anybody did complain about me living on the land I could publicly demolish this one and then I could carry on living in the tiny cabin until the four years was up. That might sound a little bit paranoid um, but bear in mind I put everything I had into buying the land so it was a quite a big gamble at the time or it felt like it anyway. So this then I built for literally nothing. Um, I did a deal with somebody to demolish a building in the middle of town and in return I got all the building materials and this is what <laughs> this is the biggest structure as I could make from what I demolished. So this then um, a friend of mine moved into and this you can see from all around it's quite obvious from the other side of the valley and and from the track that goes by and he was living in there using a wood burner smoke coming out the chimney all of that and I figured if anyone was going to complain about us then this is what would do it and uh, nobody did so <laughs> here it still is so after a few years of that um, what happened then? I think my mate moved out I moved into this for a time and then I started building the barn and this then is the barn which was uh, initially intended as a workshop and then as soon as I started actually building it, I thought actually it would be a nice place to live and so I made it into a house instead. And one of the reasons I got away with the barn, I think, uh, is because it took me so long to make it. I was so skint that uh, this is a, a barn made around, it's a pole barn, and I put the telegraph poles in for the main structure and then it was three years before I could afford to join them together with any more bits of wood. And it was a couple of years after that, that I could afford to actually start putting a roof on it. So I think the thing went up so slowly, it just um, didn't offend anybody. So this is where I've been living for the last, well, this is oh, quite some years, six or seven years, I think, something like that. So yeah, for a while. Right, let's go back inside and we'll have some more detail. So you'll have heard me there talking about the four year rule <coughs> and my interpretation of it. And it's a really important rule for people that intend to live off-grid. It is, in effect, um, an allowance for low-impact living. Because if you think about it, if you've managed to build a house and live in it for four years without anybody noticing, by definition, it had to have been low-impact. So there is a provision there which um, most people don't consider. There is also a 10-year rule, and there's much confusion between the two. The 10 year rule applies to anything other than a dwelling. So if I was to buy a piece of land and put a caravan on it and try and live in the caravan, what I'd be doing is trying to convert that land from greenfield to residential land. Now that's a change of use of land and in order for that to work it would have to be 10 years. And it's the same with anything else. If I wanted to buy a piece of land and build a factory on it and get away without planning permission at all for that again it would have to be 10 years because I'm changing that land from greenfield to industrial in that case so two different things four year rule just for houses and a 10 year rule for everything else and so that's why I don't recommend people get a mobile home necessarily or shipping container house or something like that because they're all classed as temporary structures and a temporary structure doesn't count towards that four year rule. So if you put a temporary structure on your land and live in it, you're gonna to have to be there for 10 years before you can make that legal. That might work for you, it might not, but it's something to bear in mind. The other important thing about planning is there's a lot of confusion of people between the, the difference between illegal activity and unlawful activity and I came across this all the time during my days as a traveller when we would go and occupy land or we would squat buildings and that's not illegal that's unlawful and, and the difference is that illegal activity is criminal and gets the police involved unlawful activity is civil and it gets the courts involved and it's a very different thing so bear that in mind too you can actually buy a piece of land and you can do whatever you like on it without planning permission and it's not illegal. It only becomes illegal, well 
when the council can come along and say, oh, you need permission to do X, Y, Z, they can then require you to apply for permission, turn it down, and only at that point, once your appeals are exhausted, only at that point does it become illegal. So it's important to bear in mind what, how far you can stretch things. There's also retrospective planning. So if you were to think, well, I could go and do this, that and the other, and it would all work out swimmingly, but you might think you'd have trouble convincing the council of that, you could just go ahead and do it, make it work swimmingly, and then, if needs be, apply for permission retrospectively. And that's what an awful lot of supermarkets and surprisingly big constructions actually do. When you're looking for land, there's a big difference between agricultural land and forestry land. Now I'd always personally go for forestry, or at least some forestry, because your permitted development rights are a, a, bit, a bit more lenient towards forestry than they are towards agriculture. So for instance, if you wanted to put up a barn, you might not want to live on your land, you might just want to visit it, but you might want a barn or a workshop or storage there. You're only going to have permitted development right to do that on agricultural land if it's over, I think, 12 acres. But on forestry land, it can be much smaller than that. Also on agricultural land, you're going to have to prove that there is some kind of need for it. Whereas with forestry, that's not the case. It just has to be reasonably necessary or reasonably you've got to justify it in some small way. So that, again, more leniency for, for forestry stuff. Plus forestry is really useful, you know, I, I, I have just under five acres here and that provides enough wood for me to live off, um, for, to, to use as fuel uh, all year round. And even when I had uh, a family living here in the barn, there was still plenty of fuel. So carefully managed, I, in my experience, um, what have I got, probably two, three acres of, of woodland is, is doing nicely. So yeah, bear that in mind as well. Uh, forestry is always useful in its own right. Right, so how would you find the land? And this is where a lot of people come unstuck. And I think mainly because, like anything these days, your initial idea is just go online and start looking for it. But then you're competing with all the other people that are going online and looking for it. And you're gonna be paying a higher price if you do that. I found the land that I own because I was living next door to it and I saw this piece of wasteland that nobody was doing anything with and cut a long story short, tracked down the owners, made them an offer and here I am. So I would suggest trying to talk to people, trying to get to know people in the area that you're interested in and finding things through word of mouth may well pan out a lot better than trying to buy something on the open market where you're always going to be competing with lots of other people. When looking for land, my suggestions would be to look for no public footpaths. It may be contentious to some, but if, some, if there's a public footpath across your land anywhere, that essentially gives the public the right to roam all over your land. And all you can do is politely ask them to go, which <laughs> for me didn't quite cut it. Um, yeah, I, I didn't fancy that. I would also suggest somewhere south facing. Um, I've lived in south facing land, which my land is, and I've, I've spent the winter in somewhere that was north facing and my god it was bleak so south facing i'd always suggest a hillside is also great i am um, most of my land is quite hilly which initially i thought was really awkward but it does give you lots of options for doing things and you can spread stuff around and it's it's always more interesting a, a bit of hillside i think and trees yeah trees are great i'd say for those of you that are saving up to buy land consider borrowing instead because you'll find the price of land goes up faster than you can save. So it's the one thing I would really suggest getting as big a loan as you can and going for it that way. Something I'll just drop in here because um, people are always asking about it and it's something that um, might not seem obvious first is, is post. And so when I first came here I tried to register it as an address but that turns out not to really be a thing. I went to the local post office and asked them and they were completely baffled by the whole concept. In the end they suggested that I try sending myself a letter. 
So what I did as part of my introduction to neighbours, I'd asked them what their postcode was and chose a name for my land, nailed up a post box on the gate and started sending myself letters. It took a few weeks, but eventually the postman found me and as soon as he did, I changed all my post. So everything from my tax to my bank to my mobile phone to everything I could think of, I changed to this address because again, it establishes um, residency. So I did that right from as soon as I could, right as soon as I got the postman trained, all my posts come here ever since. The Royal Mail would deliver to anywhere they can find. You know, I've had friends that have had posts delivered to their vans when they're parked in laybys. You know, if it's got an address on it that, they, that the postman can understand, they'll deliver it. It's quite an amazing service, really, so take full advantage. Right, there's bound to be people that ask, so I'll go through the numbers of my situation here. I don't think it's particularly relevant because it was a long time ago that I bought the land, but I'm sure people will ask anyway. So I own 4.8 acres. It's mostly um, a hill. I've probably got three acres of that that's woodland. I paid £15,000 for it, and that was about 14 and a half years ago, something like that. Um, and I did that, and this is a, an important point, I did that from a starting point of zero. So I borrowed the entire 15,000 as a personal loan and then I paid it back over five years. All the legal fees, which came to about 3,000 pounds I put on my credit cards and it took me seven years to clear those off. So for five years, <laughs> it, was, it was hard work, but then it was done. And that was, to me, a lot more satisfactory than, than having a, a loan over a huge a period of time. But if I'd had to, then I'd have done that as well. So, yeah. Right, so to wrap up, I hope that's explained a bit about how I've come to do it and I've given you some ideas about how you can do it. I would say the four year rule is really important to bear in mind and that gives you a lot to think about there. Just imagine for a moment what it would be like without any planning and laws. And there's, I know so many people who have said, oh, but you should be able to do what you like on your own land. Well, I always think of the time I was I spent in Colorado in, in America and there out in the mountains which were beautiful people had bought acres here and there and they had done whatever they liked with it and my god it was a mess you know and it's, that's in Colorado which is huge here in this country we simply don't have the room for people to do what they like so I think the planning laws actually are of, of benefit they are a, they are an asset more than a detriment and there are plenty of ways round them, under them, through them. You've just got to work on it a bit. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. You know, and I think in the same vein, some people would be disappointed with this video that I haven't spelt out a step-by-step -step guide into how to blag through the planning rules. You know, and the reality is you're gonna to have to do a bit of work yourselves, and that's a good thing too. If it's too easy, then people would do it who aren't into it enough if you see what I mean. So yeah you'll have to do a bit of groundwork yourselves just like I did and what worked for me may well not work for you. <laughs> That's a disclaimer. To wrap up then I am not an expert on planning. I know very little about planning really. I'm just not interested in it. I'm not interested in bureaucracy full stop really. I, you know, I try and have as little to do with all that kind of thing as possible. What I do know about planning, I learned from this book here. Now, I'll put a link in to these people. These are the, the Land is Ours, is the organisation. This is their Chapter 7 planning briefings, and it's brilliant. So, I don't know anything about planning. These guys do, and they did a book, which is excellent. This one, you can see, is well thumbed. It's well out of date, but it helped me enormously. Um, so, yeah. I highly recommend getting a copy of that. It's a cracking read. <laughs> it really is. It's not, um, everything else you'll read about planning is dry as a bone. And this is actually written in a readable manner, which is, yeah, I mean, just that is a, is a, is a huge mark in its favor. It's also stuffed full of really useful information and tips. And I reckon without this, I wouldn't have, have 
managed quite so well or possibly at all. So that's it really. I'll just conclude by saying that if you want to do it, I suggest getting on with it. Personally I did it, like I said before, from a starting point of zero and I'm sure that if there's a will, there's a way, whatever your situation. It was a big deal for me at the time to stick all of my eggs in one basket, you know, and if I could have avoided doing that I probably would have done. You know, if I could have had a if I could have had a house that I rented out whilst I bought some land, that would have been <laughs> far more ideal. If I'd had bucket loads of land and could have bought a farm from the off, I'd have done that. But you know, you've got to work with what you got. And I'll conclude by saying that I'm sure, I'm honestly sure that if, if I could do it and I've done it, then you out there can also do it. And my only real regrets in life are the things that I haven't done, you know? So I've never regretted having a go at something, even if it's ending in absolute failure. Because the alternative is to have not have had a go at anything. And for me, that's, that would have been much worse. So um, yeah, there we go. That's my take on planning and land. Thanks for watching. Cheers.